Hello and welcome. We have a fun show for you tonight. We're talking about writing, the love of the written word, the process of writing, and my guest is an award-winning author and writer. Candace Seimar is here. She's from Pequot Lakes, drove down for the interview, and she's been on before. Uh, so it's wonderful to have you back, and thank you. Thank you, Mary. For coming, coming down. Um, I am just so interested in the, the life of a writer because I think so many people want to be writers or do some writing. Um, and I think people are curious about an award-winning writer's discipline and, and uh, the process. Um, Candace was going to be on with another writer who um, got sick at the last minute, a poet. Uh, we'll have him back. And um, so this is really part one of a, a mini-series on the writing process. Well, you started writing, you told me, in your 40s? In my 40s, yes. Is it something you waited to do until you had more time and your kids were kind of launched, or, or was it just something that you got interested in at the, that point in your life? Well, I was raised on a dairy farm in western Minnesota and knew absolutely no writers. Uh -huh. um, my Aunt Ella used to write the gossip column for the local newspaper. Who where, had tea at who's who home, had tea right? And who <laughs> had a golden wedding and who was getting married, that type uh -huh. of thing. But everyone I knew um, were farmers or maybe in construction. My aunt was a beautician, but I knew no one in any kind of writing life. And my father wanted me to be a nurse. And as a compliant child, I became a nurse. And there weren't a lot of options when we were kids, were there? No. I mean, mm -mm. teacher, nurse, um, secretary. Right. Didn't call them assistants at that point, or assistant managers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you became a nurse, but then how did you shift then to becoming a writer, Candace? Well, I always wrote. Um, an avid journaler. I would write little poems and stories for my kids or for birthdays. And when my kids were finally to the age of leaving the home, I just started getting a bug to write. Mm. And started following that fire. And were your family supportive? Because it kind of takes a supportive family, I think, to make it work. It takes a supportive family because writing demands so much time mm -hmm. and so much solitude. And it's not something you can do with a lot of people. Right, right. You can't, mm -hmm. well, most people can't write in the midst of chaos. Right. Although I do see some young people, mostly young, not all, writing in coffee shops. Yes, I write in coffee shops do sometimes. Do you too? However, it works better if I don't know everyone in the community because then I'm disturbed as well. Not that I'm not happy to see people that I know. Sure, but, but um, they can break the concentration right. if they mm -hmm. come up and talk with you, I'm sure. Um, so when you started writing in a more serious way after the children's birthday uh, specials and so forth, did you right away think, think I want to write a novel or fiction? Or how did you? I actually started writing poetry ah. and little um, memoir pieces. Um, there's a very strong poet community in the Brainerd Lakes area. And so mm -hmm. I joined a poetry group. And not that I had a strong interest in poetry, but they were writers and they uh -huh. were serious about their work. Uh -huh. And I also joined a local writers group at the college in Brainerd, mm -hmm. and like all the arts, there's a subculture of people interested in yes, it. Yes. And so I, once I got into the network, and that led to um, writing workshops, mm -hmm. you know, more serious things. So you reached out and got involved with other right. writers. Mm -hmm. Not everybody does that, mm -hmm. um, but to me, that seems like a smart way. Well, it was the only way I could do it. Uh -huh, mm -hmm. To learn from, from others. And also, because I was not trained as a writer, I was trained as a nurse, 
I began um, seriously attending writing workshops. Mm. And I started by going to the University of Iowa in Iowa City. Which is a very famous, very famous workshop, isn't it? Iowa Summer Writing Festivals, amazing, wonderful opportunities for uh -huh. ordinary people to learn the craft of writing. Are those expensive, Candace? I've never looked um, into them. They're a little spendy once you pay for your lodging and your travel. Right. And it add up. You know, I used to take time off of work to go. So it became a passion. It was worth doing, well worth doing. And I also attended the Split Rock workshops mm. through the University of Minnesota. Sadly, they're no longer. Mm, and I, didn't know that. Um, I attended a wonderful workshop in Duluth at the university. And I've been out to Taos, New Mexico. Mm -hmm. and attended some wonderful workshops there, plus many, many others. Um, before we go any further, I want to just hold up your latest book because Candace has written a book that I've been reading this last couple weeks and it's so enjoyable. Um, and it is called, and I'll, I'll let my cameraman zoom in here, Shelter Belts. Um, and it is a novel, but as you said, you've written both poetry and fiction and what I think you call historical fiction. Right. And we talked about one of your books that fit in that genre um, earlier, but this is, is fiction. Yes. Although it is so true to life in rural Minnesota. Yes. That as I read it, I thought you nailed the habits, the culture, the people. Um, it's, it's really, in a way, it's historical non, it's historical fiction, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> um, it's more than 50 years old. It takes place in 1945, right at the end of World War II, about the time my parents married. And I, I have lost both my parents. This book was a tribute to their lives in the way it might have been. Oh. And you know, I um, grew up in this little Scandinavian country community, western Minnesota, Ottertail County, where everyone was white and Lutheran and very, um, almost a rigid social structure. And I never really thought that much of it until now in later years, I think. That was really unique. It was a wonderful culture in many ways. And I wanted to get it down in a story form so people could understand what it was like. It is unique. I mean, I've lived in many parts of the country mm -hmm. um, and traveled quite a lot, and it is a very unique culture, the rural mm -hmm. Scandinavian culture. Yes. Um, do you want to read a, a paragraph or two from the book to maybe give you a feel for it? Um, and we haven't talked about what section you're reading, but uh, what are you going to, to read? People ask me about the word shelter belts. Yes. And shelter belts is another name for a grove of trees planted specifically to prevent erosion and to stop snow from blowing across roads, that type of thing. And I love the word shelter belts because it's a metaphor for rural communities in so many ways as the trees protected the farmers and the land, the farmers protected each other. And I like to think that when a woman marries a farmer, she also marries their neighbors because mm -hmm. no one is moving away and you learn to get along with them. So they become a big family, don't yes, they? Yes, in mm -hmm. some ways. Mm -hmm. So um, in my story, um, Tia is the main character and she takes care of the farm when her brother goes to war. And her she's, brother Norman. Her right. brother Norman. Mm -hmm. Norman had planted the struggling row of Chinese elms and balsam firs into a much needed shelter belts along the driveway. Somehow, Tia kept most of them alive through the dry years, hauling water to the surviving trees. She often walked among them in the evening, pulling the weeds around the saplings, willing them to survive. She thought of them as a hedge against all the bad things that might happen not just the whirling snowdrifts of winter. She checked the chicks one final time. They snuggled under the heater, 
a mass of fluffy potential. She crossed the cow yard, stepping from one hummock to another, pausing to check the gate lest the young stock escape, all quiet in the pig house. The horses stood sleeping in the pasture. An owl swooped down upon a mouse in the grass with a whoosh of wings that startled her into slipping off a hummock into the black mud. The Hanson place blazed electric lights in both levels of the house. She imagined them listening to the radio and making plans for the wedding. Maybe they would mention Norman. She doubted they would think of her. She turned her face toward their little house on the hill and started home. No light showed in the windows. That's a great section to read. Um, I, I finished the book last night, and at the end I felt so good about the uh, ending, and that made me feel you really did bring the characters uh, home for me as a reader. Yeah. Um, when you write a book, you said it was hard work. It's very hard work. And I don't think most people know that. I was married to a man who died, but he was a, a writer of nonfiction. And I saw how hard writing was. And I do some writing and I realize it's hard. And yet people who don't write at all, I don't think see that. What's the hard part for you? I just read this wonderful quote about writing. And it said that the hard part is starting and not stopping. Oh. And I thought, wow, doesn't that say it all? So getting out that pen in the beginning of the beginning. Mm -hmm. time that you're I, When writing. I'm in the middle of a project, I have a two-minute rule. Mm -hmm. I force myself to work on the project at least two minutes a day because the hardest part is setting down for those two minutes and starting. So once you get started though. Right. I bet you write for a lot yes. longer than two minutes. I do, but I make myself at least for two minutes. Okay. That's mm -hmm. a parallel to people who are runners who say the hardest part is to turn the door and get out on the oh, I'm sure it's you know, very path similar. or the street. Mm -hmm. um, do you write at the same time every day? Um, I have. I think the writing process is so ambiguous that just when you think you have it, all of a sudden it's gone. And you mean the, the sense of, I want to get this down? Or just the feeling, or just the process of what works and how you do mm. it. I've had to make a few changes in my life. I teased my husband, I was going to blame him tonight for my writing process <laughs> going awry. Because um, before he retired, I had a very rigid writing schedule. Mm -hmm. And I, I did a lot of work in the morning. But when he's home, it's different. You don't have that sense of space or I don't think it's his problem. Space. I think it's my problem. Right, because right. Because it, it's more fun to go have coffee with him or find out what he's doing for the day. So you have to discipline yourself right. harder. Mm -hmm. And since he's retired, I've started going to a monastery to write. You mentioned that. Um, I became acquainted with Benedictine nuns and I travel to Bismarck, North Dakota quite often to spend a week or two um, just diligently writing. And that really helps me through the rough spots. If I'm, especially the um, first words on paper are very hard to come by. And very important And though, very too. important. Mm -hmm. This is the best of times, the worst right. of times, you know, that kind of And I find the model. monastery very conducive to writing. Um, they have a very tight schedule, they um, eat at the same time, they pray at the same time, they have blocks of space where they work and they do their thing, and I just fit into the schedule. And I love it, and it's been very uh, wonderful for me. When you think about how long it takes to write a book like this, and how many pages is it? 250, 60 pages, how long would you say, you know, and I guess you've written several. We have mm -hmm. uh, several of your books right mm -hmm. here. How long on average does it take? Um, it takes me probably at least two years. 
I would but think so. Shelter Belts took me much longer. Mm -hmm. I wrote my first um, chapter in Shelter Belts in 2005. Wow. And it published 10 years later. Wow. And I w worked on it um, off and on. And you <clears> were writing other books I was writing in the other interim. Work. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it was a, a long period like that? Well, I was working on my series, and I wanted to finish those. But I went to a workshop, and we had to write a story for the workshop. And it's, it was very difficult to bring a whole novel or a piece of a novel to a workshop. Mm. And so they wanted a complete story. Uh -huh. And so I wrote my first story for Shelter Belts in 2005. And then I went to another workshop later, and I had to have another story. And so I wrote it with the same character in mind. And I entered them into some writing contest and won prizes for both of the stories. And that I wrote was another one. Wasn't it? Yeah, and then I wrote yeah. another one, and it won a prize. And a friend encouraged me to put the stories together into a novel, and so I did. And did that become then Birdie? It became Shelter Belts. Oh, oh, oh mm -hmm. that became Shelter Belts. Yes. Okay, because. Um, I was thinking, Birdie, your novel, which we have here too, um, yes. won the Spur Award. Yes, it did. And that's a, a prestigious award. It's I a know. national award. Yes. We'll let people zoom in on this mm -hmm. or let people see this more too. Um, it's a national award given to what kind of? It was for um, juvenile fiction. And I write about Frontier, Minnesota and frontier um, stories are considered part of the Western genre. Right. And I received the award from the Western Writers of America in 2012. So the awards you've gotten mm -hmm. have to be so, um, give you such a rush of adrenaline in a, a yes, sense, right? The awards are wonderful, but what means the most to me is a reader who connects with my characters. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. the biggest award I can mm -hmm. receive. And I bet you get people coming up to you all the time telling you that they either identified with the character mm -hmm. or the character reminded you. So are you more focused on character development than descriptive writing or, or even plot, Candace? Yes, I, am, I definitely write more character driven. Although when I write historicals, the scaffolding of my work becomes the history. Mm. And I love history. I've always been a little geeky that way. And it's coming into play now. Who knew? Yes, I'm sure that you've mm -hmm. got to be fact-checking mm -hmm. with, yes, with the writing a lot I've of read research. of yours. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much history woven in. Right. Um, even things that might not be technically history, but that tie into history. Yes, the culture. Right, and the, the cultural um, specific The things. music the fads, mm -hmm. the issues mm -hmm. of the day. Has your style changed much since, you know, the last, well, I guess, what, has it been 15 years that you've been writing? Um, yes, about. About 15. Has it changed much? Yes, I'm still learning. I have more to learn. Um, I think that's the fun of writing. It's a lifelong sport. Yes, and you can very, keep doing it. And very few people ever get to the point where they say they've learned it all. And Is that right when you talk to other writers? Right. Mm -hmm. oh, that's interesting. There's always that's kind more. of a humble approach, mm -hmm. isn't it, when you think about it? Mm -hmm. Because I don't think most people in the world of finance or politics or entertainment would mm -hmm. say that. That's interesting. Yes, yeah, there's always more to learn. What's the best advice you've ever gotten from a fellow writer? Well, um, there's two ways to look at it. I was told early on to write what you know, and I certainly do that with my culture, my yes. Scandinavian culture. Shelter belts was certainly yes. that. But I also heard someone say, write what you want to know. Mm. And so maybe the best advice is a combination of those two things, which seem opposite, to really delve into the history, which is such a delight and pleasure for me, and then to dig deeper into the history. When I started writing my pioneer books, I felt I knew a lot about the Great Sioux Uprising of 1862. 
-hmm. and that I knew a lot about Minnesota history. I was really um, surprised at how little I knew as I did my research and dug into the layers and layers and all the complex <coughs> issues. And that was quite an education. The book that I read of the series, Pomme de Terre, am I pronouncing it correctly? Yes. Mm -hmm. Told about the 1862 war from point of view of the Indian families and the white settlers, and it certainly was packed with mm -hmm. detail and learning yes. of, of our history. Um, it's a great book. Um, when you uh, and I were talking earlier, you said you are doing poetry yes. writing too. Mm -hmm. Is that something you find easier or harder than than fiction writing? Well, poetry is certainly not easy. Um, it's distilling a thought down to the bare bones of mm -hmm. words. And I don't claim to be a great poet. Um, but there is something very satisfying about writing a poem that um, really communicates your heart. And I love that when it happens. And do you write poetry much? I mean, are you, I, I don't know how you have time to write as much as you do. I but. usually write poetry in the car. When oh, I'm driving oh. alone, poetry will come to me oh. in the car. Oh. So. And then how do you, how do you, um, do, do you uh, pull over and jot down <laughs> ideas? Sometimes, or? sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people have a little microphone they can talk into or talk into their phone nowadays. Mm -hmm. I have a good friend who's a poet, and um, she, it seems, writes kind of just inspiration hits her and she right. writes. Is that true for you with poetry Probably. too? Probably more for poetry. The other writing I can do it if I can get myself to focus, but How poetry about, I have to be inspired. Okay, so that is more the mm -hmm. emotional Probably. kind of writing. I remember um, hearing Judith Guest talk with me on, on during an interview about writing ordinary people. And she said that she just struggled with the dialogue. Mm -hmm. She said, I would say to myself, if he says this, what, what would she say? And she said, it was almost like pulling teeth. Mm -hmm. And I was so surprised because I just didn't expect it would be that hard. It's hard because but the dialogue is agreeing. different. Uh -huh. um, we don't, the dialogue in a book really cannot be how people speak because we have so many fillers, we repeat mm -hmm. ourselves, we, we do all kinds of um, things that do not work in, Little in the tangents. written page. <laughs> yes. It has to be very succinct, unique, and cannot repeat. That's a very interesting <laughs> point. I've never heard a writer say that, but mm -hmm. you're right. If I think about my conversations, it would be, it wouldn't work to just write them down. Right. Um, oh, that's very, yeah, that's, that's an important differentiation. Mm -hmm. And I do keep a list of unique um, phrasing and um, dialogue that I've heard and try to use it in my oh, work. Okay. So you'll, you'll refer to that and say, yes. can I fit that in here or mm -hmm. fit that in there? Um, we've just got a few minutes left. Publishing is one of the toughest parts for a writer yes. to deal with. Um, and you've been fortunate. You've had your books published. So many really fine writers don't find a publisher. So they may self-publish now, which is easier, but mm -hmm. it can be so disappointing. It's so hard. Um, there are 30,000 books a month published. 30,000 a, a month, is that in our country or in the world? I think it's the publishing industry. Okay, wow. But um, with the onset of PCs, it's much easier for everyone, anyone who wants to can write a book, and then with self-publishing options. Um, so the market is glutted with books. So if you are lucky enough to be published, it's usually on your shoulders to push the book, isn't yes. it? Yes. I published with North Star Press of St. Cloud, a very um, wonderful family-run business that have been in business for almost 50 years. Mm. 
uh, mother-daughter business, and they've done a great job for me. But as a small press, they do not do a lot of marketing. They do what they can. And the big, um, the big companies don't do a lot of marketing. No. I mean, they choose like eight or 10 books, right. and the others are on their own. Right. I know my husband found that out. And so that's, that's one of the hard realities of the life of a writer. So I tend to do a lot of public speaking. I speak to a lot of civic groups, historical groups, Scandinavian groups, schools, and do book talks and go around and market my books. Come on my show. And come on your show, yes. Um, I want to give you a website, so if you want to learn more about Candace Seimar's work, you can. Uh, it's www.candacemar.com. And again, Shelter Belts is the name of the book. We'll get one more quick peek at it here. And your other books, too, are still yes. available. Mm -hmm. Can people write to Amazon and get them? or um, the I sell them way? right off my website. Oh, they're okay. also available on Amazon. They're in e-books. They're in audio books. Okay. And um, they're still um, selling well, actually. That is, that is great. Um, you'll see the books titled uh, on your website. Well, thank you so much for you. coming down. And best of luck with, with all of these books. Thank you for being with us. We'll be back again next week. Until then, have a good week.